Welcome to the Every Nation West Coast podcast. We are so glad that you joined us. Let's get into the word. Thank you, Dennis. Hi, everyone. I'm doing the pastor's thing. You know, you put the watch on the pulpit because then you don't talk too long. All right. Um, does Dennis talk long? Oh, I saw, some, I saw some very aggressive nods there, okay? Oh, boy, Dennis, you're in trouble now. Uh, but we honor these guys. They are amazing. Um, they're not just our family. We would say they're amazing, but they are. You guys have got great pastors, and I hope that you look after them and honor them and bless them. And, man, this church is growing. It's a long, thin church. It's like, talk, it's like preaching to a bus, okay? It's like... Tickets, God gives us a belief. Okay, it's like, you know, it's like, all right. Um, and you have the finest kids pastor, leader, I don't know if she's called a pastor, but like she is, okay, in, you know, Angela and her team. And you were definitely one of the three or four churches that carried this kids ministry conference, okay? We had 571 kids in total that we had 450 in our group and I think Angela had like 90 like twos and threes. Have you ever tried dealing with one? Okay. (laughs) And I don't know how she does it. Okay. I can, I think there's a grace for different things. All right. And, um, but true to form, we are kids people. So we have to have a few um, items with us today. Okay. So I need a couple of like creative volunteers. If you think that you creative, and we're here in this beautiful college where they create art, you have like, yeah, him looking at you. <laughs> Hugh Grant, okay? Hugh Grant is not the Messiah, okay? Jesus is, all right? But he just looks upon us. It's probably because Nikki had a crush on Hugh Grant when she was younger, okay? Did you know that, okay? He's... His movie was like her ultimate favorite, like, you know, so, so she walked into this church and they were like, Lord, let's seek the Lord. Whoa. It's a sign, okay? All right. So who's creative in this place? I want some creative, oh, thank you, thank you, creative person. Okay. More creative people. Thank you, my niece. Here we go. You volunteered. It's nice when you've got family. Anybody else? Yes, you can appoint yourself. You can even appoint others. That's scary. Because this is a bus after all. All right. Anybody else? Come in. There must be some creative people at the back here on the sound desk because they're just sitting there between the sound desk. Somebody. Yeah, you look. Yeah. Okay. You look like you're creative. Right at the back. Oh, right at the back. Yeah, you, you know the back of the bus is always the naughty people, huh? <laughs> Who have to jump on the bus. Yes. And I've got one more. Let's see. Maybe I should just pick on Dennis. Okay. Yeah. Or his sister, because Joanne's the artist. She's got more talent in art than her brother. Okay. <laughs> All right, so fantastic. So they have clay. So your job in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes is to mold something of your choice, all right? Because this molding putty clay does not resist you. You are the master craftsman of this clay. So you can kind of make anything that you want. But God is the master craftsman and all of you on the bus or his clay, or his putty. The problem is, you like to do it yourself. Now that little putty pot is not going like, okay, mold me into a spoon, okay? But you sometimes are saying to God, I don't want to be molded the way you want to mold me. I want to do my own thing. I like DIY, okay? I like to do it myself, but God... In his word, in Isaiah 64 verse 8, says, You are our father, we are the clay, and you are the potter. We hear that story often. It's repeated in Jeremiah 18 verse 6, says, As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. 
So God uses that and he says, like you, I want to form you. I want to shape you. And even as we worship today and as uh, some of the words were shared, it's like God has a plan for your life. And he wants to mold you. And sometimes it's really nice and sometimes it's not nice. Okay? Sometimes it's a painful molding. Right? This little clay because it doesn't have like a heart. Oh, he's really enjoying it. He's like into it, okay? Uh, uh, he's, he's not crying, but sometimes you cry, all right? Because God is this master craftsman. But we have been made with a choice. He wants us to kind of co-labor, co-create even ourselves, all right? Because he has made us in his image. He is the creator, creator, and he has given us the ability to create, Isaiah 46, verse 8 to 11, says some other things about God. Do not forget this. Keep it in mind. Remember this, you guilty ones. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. He knows where the bus is heading with all the passengers. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I'll say that again. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. So God has his way in your life. But that could sound like, well, then is God this just this like master craftsman? I'm just like, you know, This putty in his hand, I can do what he's just there molding me and what have I got to do with it? No, it's this partnership. It's all about relationship. And I think as we were singing and worshiping today and as we sang and worshiped Jesus in front of 500 children over this last week, we wanted to worship Jesus because he is awesome and he's amazing and he's powerful. So this God that we worship who does shape us and who does mold us and does have his way also loves us. It's kind of a crazy tension that we have, okay, that, that God is like, you know, so big, gets his way, but he invites us to come in with a choice. He has a will, so do we have a will. When we pray, we often have this tension between like, well, I want this, but does God want that? His ways are higher than our ways. So often our prayers are like, God, please do this. But maybe he's looking down and saying, well, I don't want to work it that way. I'm not going to do it that way. And that's where it becomes very tense for us. That's where we get frustrated. And I think some of our biggest frustration as, as believers and followers of Jesus is timing, right? Because God's timing is not our timing. Sometimes we want something so bad and even God wants that thing for us. But he thinks, oh, a year's time and we want it now. Okay? And we act like the people in the back row of the bus, all right? the naughty ones. We're like, we want it now. Okay? We feel like, we, we, like spoiled brats sometimes going to God with our prayers. Like, like this thing that we want and this prayer that we want answered, but we want it now. And God is like, no, you're not ready for it. I can't give it to you now. It doesn't fit into my bigger plan. And that's where it becomes so frustrating sometimes. But we need to know that God has the best plan because he is the master craftsman and he is molding us. And all things do work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We have to do the yielding to that. A couple more stories from the Bible. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21 gives us an example. And this was where Jesus is working with Peter and, and, and Jesus is on his, on his plan. He's going to the cross and his disciples kind of just don't get this. All right? And uh, it says, verse 21, Matthew 16, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, 
the leading priests and the teachers of religious laws. He would be killed. They didn't like that, okay? But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. And Peter took Jesus aside, okay? I think we do that sometimes. We take God aside and give him a piece of our mind, right? Yes, and he's okay with that because that's part of relationship. And, uh, and he says, says to him, Peter took him aside and he began to reprimand him. Imagine reprimanding God, okay? For saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, that will never happen to you. Here he is trying to stand in the way of what he perceives is the wrong way. All of us with, you know, perspective know that like, man, he couldn't stop Jesus. If he had stopped Jesus, where would we be? We'd all be lost, okay? Pretty thankful that Jesus then says to Peter, he says, get away from me, Satan. Oh, these guys are like really having it out here. Huh? You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. How many times do we do that? We see it from our point of view. I went to go fetch Yama and Lynn from um, the city center this morning, and we're staying with Dennis and Nikki. So I was driving along this road, and uh, you know there's a little hump that goes up, and you've got sun stays on the right, okay? Anybody know where Sun Stays is? It's like a, just past Milnerton, there's like a little hotel there. And as we went up that rise, I had these visions of my car breaking down because it happened to us once before, right there on that, on that hill. And we'd been driving all the way from, from Joburg to Cape Town and it broke down right there, stuck in the traffic, all these cars going past. My kids were much younger. We're trying to keep our kids out of the road and whatever and all these things happening. And I'm thinking like, God, what is this purpose, you know? And yet God always has a purpose for things. It doesn't always go the way that we expect or the way we want to. Acts 16 is another story of that. So we can build the story. This time it's Paul and Silas, not Peter and Jesus, but Paul and Silas, and they've traveled through the area of Pergia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. The Holy Spirit prohibited them from going? That's weird. You know, didn't we just have a go conference? Surely it's like we could just go anywhere and preach the gospel. Go to the nations, Dennis said. And here it says like, but the Holy Spirit prevented them going. See, sometimes we're on a, on a road, we're trying to go somewhere, do something, and be somebody. Some of our young people here, you know, you're just about finishing school, and you're like on a mission, this is where I'm going, this is what I've wanted to do. And all the doors just close around you. And it could be so frustrating. But you know what? God has a bigger plan. Because some things we want to go into, we think they're the right thing to go into, and you just hit this wall. And that sometimes it's the Holy Spirit that is stopping you. Then coming to the borders of Mercia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So here are these guys, these are missionaries. We're going to take the nations, you know. And a second time they stopped because the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Now it doesn't say how that happened, but it said, Jesus said no, okay. Maybe they were just praying and they're like just, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's not going, okay. So instead they went on through Mycia to the seaport of Troas. That night Paul had a vision a man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So shut door, shut door, pray, vision, open door, and they in a totally different direction to what they thought that they were going to do, where they were going to be. And that happened to us. So 
2019, there was also a world conference, okay? And this time it was in the US. And Joanne and I had been to America before, and for a few years we'd been praying, like, God, we really have America on our hearts. Like, we, it just feels like you want to use us in America. And we'd been praying, and at that world conference, Joanne felt like that confirmation had come from the Lord, and uh, we left that conference, and we went to Simon, our pastor in Joburg, some of you know him, and we said to him, uh, we feel like God is, is calling us to the U.S. And he said, please don't leave me, okay? Not for a year, all right? And, uh, and so we said, okay, we will not leave you for a year. And we started to hand over things. We handed over our regional positions. We handed over our leading our kids' ministry. And um, because the U.S. was going to happen, and we were going to join an Every Nation church, a church plant in Denver, Colorado, we were really excited. We had meetings with their pastors, and, you know, the, the church planting team. It was really exciting, awesome, and we were on our way. Then COVID happened. Lockdown happened. Remember that year? It's there somewhere in your, like, remembrances. And, uh, and it put everything on hold. And we waited and we waited, and all our plans changed. But in October 2020, the first airplane left South Africa, and I think we were on like the second one. Yay, going where God had called us to the U.S. We got to Denver, Colorado. The day we got there, and the church plant was still meeting in homes, they shut down everything again. And for six months that we were there, we had a visitor's visa. We were, we were still applying for our religious workers visa, which takes time. We were on a visitor's visa. We had six months, and the whole six months we were there, no church meetings, okay? You couldn't even go across the, na- to the street to your neighbor's house. It was so tightly locked down. And we were staying with a family in the basement of their house. It was very nice, but we were in this basement, and we were like, Lord, is this what we signed up for? You know? Is this your plan? We've just left our, our family. We've left our ministry. We've left so much. And here we, you know, we want to do your will, and... Man, it just seemed so difficult. Some of you can relate to that. You've stepped out in faith. You've responded to the call of God. And you're like, what is happening? Because it doesn't, doesn't feel like, you know, God seems to be blessing it. And we spent six months in there. We had so much faith and expectation that we would reach lots and lots of people. But the family that we were with were ministered to by, by us. And they had three children, and their oldest daughter was resistant to Jesus. We asked her many times, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? She was like eight years old. No, okay. She was resistant. But on the very last day of our six months, we were sitting at the airport coming back to South Africa because our visa had run out. That was the first day where they had a, a church service for their church, the day we left. And at that service, they had a, a, an altar call, and this little girl who we'd spent six months with walked down the front and gave her heart to Jesus. And we were like, wow. So God, you only took us there for all of that, for like one person to actually like respond. And I really do believe that God will take you somewhere, even if it's just for one person, because that one person matters. And while he's doing that, he's also molding you like these guys are still, is it coming into anything? Like, oh no, oh, he's doing it again, okay, yeah. You see, uh, because he's molding us and he's doing things in our lives while we're on this journey. There was many things we went through Sometimes painful things. We cried. Joanne and I cried. Gabby was with us too. She probably cried too, but less because she's like strong. But like mom and dad, like we, you know, we cried. And, uh, and we had to give up on that dream because it just didn't happen for us there. And, um, and then God redirected us through a phone call to another church in the U.S. And we went to that church and for... A year we were there, online kids pastors, okay? It was a great church, wonderful. 
But we were waiting in South Africa for our visa to come again. All the way through 2021, okay? Praying all these amazing prayers, you know, like, God, send us, do your will, or, you know. And by October of that year, we had to say, like, if the visa doesn't come, what then? And we decided that on the 31st of December, 2021, if the visa didn't come, we would have to hand over that position. And again, we'd be like, you know, another like disappointment. And, and, and we, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And during that time, a number of people said to us, probably in just general conversation, like, it's so sad that like somebody in, our, in a visa office is stopping the will of God. And I, and I looked at them, and it happened a number of times, and I thought, there's nobody stopping the will of God. Because what we read here is that God gets his way. His purposes are much bigger. There's nobody that is holding you back from what God wants to do in your life at all. all right? He can do absolutely anything. If he wanted to take that visa application and flip it to the top of the, the pile, he could have done that. He could have spoken to somebody somewhere, connected the dots, got us extra favor, and made it happen like this. But he didn't. And we had to struggle with the frustrations of like, we feel like God has said this, but it's not working. But in that time, he's still working on us, still shaping us. And many of you are in that situation right now. You're trying desperately to follow Jesus and he's given you a word. And it's painful. And sometimes it doesn't work out exactly like you would imagine it. So during the December, as we are praying and praying for this visa to come so we can go back to the US and, and carry on the things that God has called us to do, my, my one son says to us over the dinner table, he says like, Dad, if God doesn't open the door to the US, would you think of going to the UK? I was like, no. <laughs> now, I was born in, in London. I have a British passport, okay? But it was never, ever, ever on my agenda to, to go to UK. It, in fact, it had never even crossed my mind because we were on our way to the US, okay, to serve the Lord and do mission and plant churches and whatever. And we said no. And that night, Joanne had a dream about the UK that rocked our world because in the dream was like this Macedonian man, but they were a bunch of young people in the dream saying, come and disciple us. And we were like, wow, this was weird. So we will wait to the 31st, Lord, okay, and see what God is doing, you know. And we waited 31st, no visa, transitioned that leadership. I went to Pastor Roger and Pastor Simon and said, you know, could it be after all of this journey that God has closed one door to open another door? And they got it so excited, you know. Roger, Roger was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll call Pastor Wolfie in London. Let's, let's set something up, you know. And we found ourselves in, in April 2022, that's last year, time goes by, um, in England going around all the different churches because we have a few having a look. And God spoke to us and showed us an open door in the London church. And after going to all these different churches, we knew God had spoken. And it was literally through a door, okay, that God would open a door for us. And we went to this church, and Pastor Wolfie actually even said to us, have you seen the door? And we're like, oh, we see a lot of doors, you know. Um, he said, you've got to go to the door. And from the church building in London, there's literally a door that goes into an alleyway through another door into a community, a housing community of social housing. In England, that's like the, the sort of poorer working class people 
that are getting government grants and everything. And there's 700 units and the people are unchurched. And he says, we're in this church. We have this door that goes through. But everybody else comes in the other door, you know. But there's this door in the back of the church that goes into this community. What if God is calling you to work in this community? And like we just could not get rid of that, that door picture in our minds. And... Um, so we then moved everything towards like, okay, let's, let's pursue this. And, uh, and having had such resistance to the U.S., everything flowed to the U.K. Jayanne got a, 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 not a spousal visa, an ancestral visa from her Scottish grandfather, okay? Um, we had this huge amount of money that we had to raise. It was so easy to raise it, Okay to get us there, and, um, and, we, and we got to got to England and had to now work through this door, and it then gets more challenging and more difficult, because when you're right there in the midst of what God is doing, it's not always so easy, and we thought, okay, we can, we can start to, to reach this community by uh, starting an art club for their young people. That was, our, that was our, our sort of strategy. And uh, we made flyers and we walked around the community. And uh, people in England are, are kind of like polite, but kind of not interested if they're unchurched. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, nice, but whatever. And anyway, we, we went around this community talking and sharing and, and, uh, and, putting flyers into people's hands and post boxes and everything. And we started the art club. And on the first afternoon of the art club, we got all the art ready, set up. How many people came? Zero, okay. Man, it's hard to be pursuing the plan and the purpose of God and then not to have the encouragement, okay. And a lot of people quit there, and they're like, ah, okay, so it wasn't God, move on to the next thing. No, you have to persevere. If, if you know that God is something, and he's given you a task to do, and we went the second week. How many people came? Zero. I think the third week, one person came, but she was a, the child of somebody that worked at the church. So she just happened to be around. So we did art with her anyway, okay? The fourth week, we decided to take the art club outside the door. So we opened the door, went into the community, like which is not very PC in England, okay? And walked into the community, dumped our table in the middle, hoping that somebody would see it from a window and maybe come. And three people came, three kids. Muslim girl, two other boys, none of them ever been in a church before. Okay. We worked with them, doing some paintings and art and whatever. Halfway through the afternoon, they wanted to actually come and look at the church. They took a step into the church building and they were like, whoa, what is this place? Okay. And um, fourth week, one of those three came back. The next week, one brought a friend. And by the end of eight weeks, we had six children who had come. We had the summer holidays off, and now we've just, a few weeks ago, started our second season, and all six have come back. None of them are churched. None of them are Christians. None of them know Jesus. Okay? And we have now building relationship with them because we need to build enough trust with them we felt sometimes it's not like that but we felt that if we share Jesus too quickly they're just going to bolt okay or the parents are going to go like no 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 we're not letting you go there okay so we're trying to build relationship with them and their families to the place where we will share the gospel with them and trust for their salvation But these journeys are long and they're challenging. And I'm sharing this because there are many of you that are in that situation. 
your journeys have been long and challenging and you've been praying and trusting and sometimes the doors have shut and sometimes the doors are sort of half open and I really believe that God just wants to encourage you today to keep holding on to that that God has called you but to know that God is big enough to change things at the drop of hand he can do it and that while you're on that journey he is molding you. He is shaping you. He's shaping your character. Sometimes it's extremely humbling. Sometimes taking away things from you feels so sore in your, in your heart. We have cried. Jay can tell you there was one day in London where it was just so difficult and so challenging and I've been working on something and it hadn't happened and I felt so attacked and I just went to uh, our, our bedroom and I lay on the bed and I wept, okay? I cried like I have never cried before in my life. Sobbed my heart out. For like 45 minutes, I was like this howling wreck, okay? I don't know what Jan, I mean, she was just, she eventually came up and she was just there and she was like praying and I could hear her praying and I, like I was in a deep, dark place with, but Jesus was there. And at the end of the 45 minutes, his presence was there. And everything changes when Jesus is there. And it was like I, I got up and it was like, man, that's a dying to self. It's a humbling. It's a place of weakness. You don't have to be in a place of strength for God to do something with your life. In fact, you need to probably be in a place of weakness because when you are weak, he is strong. So sometimes when you feel that way, that's just where the breakthrough is going to come. And we've had many breakthroughs and many times of pain and times of crying. Now I'm working in a, in a, in a school one day a week. God opened a door for a school. Um, and I'm teaching sport. Now I'm, I like running, but I don't, I'm not a huge sportsman. But there was a gap for a, in, with a Christian organization to go into a normal government school and, uh, and be their sports coach. And I'm like, I'm taking this opportunity. But it's tough. There's one little boy, his name is Adam. And to me, he's like the devil incarnate. Okay, It's like, you know... <laughs> He is so difficult, challenging, rebellious, and he's nine, okay? You know, you just want to take him and put him on the wall like you Grant, you know, and like say, stay, okay? But you can't do that, you know? Um, trying, trying, trying. But Adam needs Jesus. And this whole way through the conferences, I've been here ministering to all those hundreds of children. I've been praying for Adam because Adam doesn't know Jesus. Adam's parents don't know Jesus. Probably nobody in Adam's immediate, you know, community is really serious about the Lord. And if he doesn't come to Jesus, what's his life going to shape into? So sometimes you might be just going for that one, one Adam. So in conclusion... Let's have a look at what you guys created. Joanne, what did you create? Awesome. I told you she was a, an artist, okay? There, can you see that flower, okay? That's pretty awesome. And Joanne, why did you create that flower? Because I like flowers. Because <laughs> you like flowers. Is there something more spiritual behind it or not? Um, I guess at the conference, um, one of the kids... Uh, Pastor Tim Johnson had kids prophesy and one of the kids saw a flower for a little girl and it seemed like a very simple word but you know he said it's all about flourishing and so maybe someone here today just needs to know that God has them growing and flourishing. Wow that's very awesome. Let's move to the side of the bus. This guy has created and uncreated and fixed and which is pretty much like the story God is working on us and sometimes yeah, what have you made here? It's in about 25 parts, okay? So there's no ways that you're going to see it, okay? But what did you make eventually? 
Um, first thing I did was I made a shoe. It looks nice. It looks kind of small, but yeah, it's a shoe. Because then the first thing I saw was walking, so I was like, okay, cool, I like shoes. And then the next one I made was, I actually don't even know. It looks cool though. It looks like, like a banana mixed with like, um, <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain it. It's basically what I got from that day was, sometimes you don't even know what to do and just do it, you know? And then if it speaks to you, let it be. Flow. That's and awesome. Flow, flow. You're not done, I know, but you've got a lot there, okay? <laughs> Hello. He could preach for now. Um, I made a cross. Okay, there's a green cross. <laughs> um, I made it because it was the first thing that I thought of to make. I'm not actually very creative, so it was also easy to make. Um, <laughs> and also, it's, it reminded me that God shapes us into someone more like him. As we read his word, as we listen to what he's saying, as we worship him, we become more like him. Well, that's the goal. So that's Wow. Brilliant, eh? Brilliant, eh? You all. Let's over here. Can, yeah, these very small, but it's a beautiful cat. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's a cat. Uh, just as well, I didn't say, that's a beautiful elephant that you've made there, okay? I like that. <laughs> They'll never invite me back. I made it because my brothers and sisters, their grandchildren, they are always playing with the dough. So they actually taught me to make this. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Very awesome. Right, where was the next one? Oh, yes, the sound desk people. Give it up for the sound desk. Okay, two, two green men. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I felt that the Lord was saying that his power works in community. So I made two people standing together, and I just felt that the Lord was saying that, you know, on one, we are only as strong as, as one person, but when we are together, we can be so much stronger. Um, yeah. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. And the naughty children at the back? All the way to the back. Yes. So my wife created this. It's beautiful. I don't know what the story is behind it but it's a little heart. It's a beautiful red heart. Yeah, with flowers around it. She's a very lovable person, but I don't know the story behind it. She's breastfeeding. <laughs> yeah, it's community, eh? You know, like, you can ask her when she's done, okay? And over here? Um, I built a house and a tree and a person sitting under the tree with a chair. Um, the story behind it is more the tree that was the first thing I built where God is saying, uh, I am the vine and we are the branches. And then whoever builds his house on the sand without him, you know, it falls apart, whatnot. And then the person resting under Jesus is the tree of life. All that story, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> love it. They love it. They love it. I think that was all of them, eh? Did I miss anybody? Oh, I missed somebody. Well, fruit. Yes, a bunch of grapes. Just from the color purple, um, just a reminder that God can turn your grapes into wine when you need it, and whenever you need it. Wow, that's beautiful. Beautiful, eh? Wow. That's for all those who are in Paul drinking wine. Okay. <laughs> wow. So God can create and shape. And really the key, I, in closing, I actually wanted to take all of this and think, like, what one word would I take from this message? And you probably have many different words, but I would say it's yield. Okay. You know, when you're driving your car and you're heading into a intersection and there's a yield there all you have to do is kind of look around you quickly sum up the situation and you don't stop you don't give up and you don't just you know because somebody could hit you from the side you look around you and then you yield and go with the way that Jesus wants you to go in so let's close our eyes and pray Lord we thank you for awesome time that we've had in your presence today, Lord God. Thank you that you are an amazing, incredible, incredible God. 
Thank you, Lord God, for the beautiful way that you have made each one of our lives. And thank you, Lord God, that you've made them with purpose, you've made them with plans. Thank you, Lord God, that you open some doors. And thank you, Lord, that you shut some doors. Lord, sometimes it's really difficult. It's really challenging. Timing can be so frustrating, God. But thank you, Lord, that you have called us to co-create a life and, and, and touch people as we, as we follow you. And you don't just force your, your ways. But Lord God, you allow us to yield to who you are and what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you were blessed by that word. For more information, visit our website at everynationwestcoast.org. Hope to see you next time.